before we get going with today's video, I would just like to congratulate the team at NASA, especially JPL, for the excellent safe landing of the Perseverance on Mars. Here's to the exploration for signs of life on the Red Planet, and here's to evolving the world of space travel. And yes, it's going to be our background for today's video. It seemed fitting. I think it's pretty fair to say that if you're subscribed to this channel, or indeed you've clicked on the thumbnail to watch it, you're someone who was at least open to the idea that battery electric vehicles will play a significant role in the electrical grid of the future. At least, that's if you discount those trolling the exact opposite in the comments section, complaining about how electric vehicles are worse for the planet than any other form of transport out there. Oh, and yes, all of those coal fire power stations that are supposed to charge them. Nevertheless, even if you consider yourself a pro-electric vehicle consumer, you are probably well aware of some of the fear-mongering that's been going around on the media of late especially in the light of the unusually cold weather that's hit a large swathe of the US right now, a polar vortex that's almost single-handedly managed to bring one of the US's biggest states, Texas, to its knees. In breathless tones, mainly but not exclusively on traditionally hard-right conservative news channels and news sites, commentators have used Texas's widespread blackouts as a reason why the governments of the world cannot and most definitely should not rely on renewable energy to power the grid. To argue why fossil fuels are the only way forward, politicians, for example, like Dan Crenshaw from Texas and the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, have even piled on, spreading misinformation about renewable energy and how they believe it will only be detrimental to the future of America. They've even used what happened as a direct attack on the Green New Deal and Congresswoman Alessandro Ocasio-Cortez. And of course, it's only a short step from there to the old chestnut of oft-debunked notions that electric cars are only going to make events like this a billion times worse. Imagine, they ask, if we were all to drive electric cars when that storm hit. Imagine, they cry, if electricity was the only way we could fuel our cars. If a little storm can bring down the electrical grid, what will happen when all of these electric cars are plugged in that are supposed to save us? And then, of course, usually the discussion falls down the deep rabbit hole of conspiracy theories and what-ifs. And yes, I was exaggerating the multipliers back there, obviously. Usually, I know our viewers don't like it when we cover politics or things that are political in nature, but this one seems just too important to not cover, or at least to use as a spring forward to providing these myths wrong. So today, I'm going to briefly discuss what happened in Texas, explain why renewable energy and microgeneration could have made things a whole lot easier were they more common in Texas, and detail why electric vehicles and renewable energy will help, not hinder, the electrical grid of the future. Let's start with the snowstorm. And if you're feeling the brunt of this cold weather, you have my sympathy. We had a foot or snow of snow here at the studio last weekend, but most of it has gone at lower elevations, and thankfully we kept our power throughout. I'm not a meteorologist, but the storm itself occurred as a side effect of the disruption of the jet stream that sits high above the North American continent. It allowed super cold air that would ordinarily be high in the Northern Hemisphere to be drawn south, interacting with the warm front and causing the white stuff to fall. And while it might sound like a contradiction, freak weather events like this are just going to become more common as the jet stream continues to weaken and destabilize as a consequence of anthropogenic climate change. Global warming doesn't just make the weather warmer, it makes the weather more erratic. Now to Texas and its electrical grid. And this one is highly political. In the lower 48 states of the US, there are three main electrical grid systems. There's the Eastern Interconnection, the Western Interconnection, and let's call it the Texas Interconnection. Inside each of these interconnections are many different utility companies and energy generators. Sometimes you might have multiple utility companies even servicing customers in different parts of the same metropolitan area. But the important thing to know is that all of the member utilities within a particular interconnection 
can buy and sell power from other regions or providers in the same interconnection. But in Texas, that's not the case. And it's not the case because Texas as a state, or rather its lawmakers, did not want the state of Texas's utility grids to be regulated by the federal government, which was a requirement to be a member of the other two interconnection regions under the 1935 Federal Power Act. So, in its very own special Texas way, Texas made its own electrical grid, with only a handful of Texan cities, like El Paso in the West, actually getting their power from outside of the state. This means Texas avoids all kinds of federal regulations about how electric grids should operate, but it also means that it's less likely to be ready for extreme weather events, even if they have happened in the past. They have, because of chronic mismanagement within the electrical grid. As to connections to other states, they do exist, but they usually remain de-energized. Because Texas wants to be free from FERC, that's the Federal Energy Regulation Commission, so it hasn't made use of those interconnections to other regions that much. There have been a few instances where power has flowed in or out of Texas via a grid connection, such as the infamous midnight connection between Texas and Oklahoma sometime in the 1970s, but for the most part, Texas has sat on its own with its own grid. The trifecta in this perfect storm, though, was a grid that didn't have much in the way of reserve power, as well as power stations that frankly weren't designed to operate in super cold temperatures. A grid that, when demand for electricity spiked, just couldn't cope. Making things worse, natural gas-powered power stations weren't getting enough fuel to operate because everyone in their homes was turning the heating up, and some wind turbines were reportedly freezing to a halt. That ultimately led the grid to become increasingly overloaded as demand outstripped supply, and in the end, many types of power stations were just forced to close down to protect themselves from brownouts and power overloads. Oh, but I hear you say, wind turbines operate in cold weather conditions, and you would be right, they do, as do many types of power generation facilities that found themselves being shut down in Texas. Here's the reason why. Because they were designed and deployed in Texas, nobody predicted temperatures this extreme would hit, or rather nobody listened to those who said they would. And in this case, I think we can blame those who specced and signed off on technology that was deployed in Texas, not taking into account possible extreme weather, which, by the way, has happened an average every 10 years or so, for the whole problem. It's simple. Renewable energy is not something that just works in warmer places. Essentially, Texas ignored the warnings from past freak cold events and continued as before. Sorry, Texas, it's the implementation, not the technology, that needs blaming. That and political stuff that I'm not going to touch with a barge pole. By now, you are probably wondering why I'm talking about Texas and its electrical grid, and not about electric vehicles. So. Let's look at the solutions that electric vehicles can offer to these problems, as well as the benefits of an increased renewable mix on the electrical grid. As I am sure you all know by now, electric vehicles really come into their own when a major storm hits. Obviously, at the top of the list is vehicle-to-grid technology. We've seen that demonstrated by Nissan with its LEAF and EMV200 electric vehicles. Using the Chidemo charging standard, these vehicles can operate as emergency power generators, turning the energy stored into their battery packs into useful AC power to provide backup power to homes and businesses that are fitted with two-way Chidemo charging stations. However, historically, these have been too expensive for most people to buy and install in their homes. In recent years, however, we have seen a major investment in and drop in price of Chidemo V2G infrastructure. It is still pretty uncommon in the US, but it's gaining significant popularity in Europe. My buddy Robert Llewellyn is even taking part in a V2G pilot project and has done several videos about it on the Fully Charged channel, so I'll be sure to link to them below. A vehicle-to-grid technology can, of course, operate in several ways. You've got the type that connects to the wider electrical grid and provides a healthy utility grid with extra storage capacity during off-peak periods and extra power capacity during peak periods without either wasting electricity or forcing the utility company to turn on supplemental power stations or peaker plants. These two-way power transfers rely on putting small amounts of power out of multiple electric car battery packs throughout the grid, which 
doesn't actually put individual car batteries under a lot of strain. In fact, some studies, like those carried out by Honda in its most recent V2G pilot project, suggest that using cars like this can actually help with the lifespan of their battery packs. The second type is the emergency, give me all the power to my home scenario, where the grid goes off and your car becomes the sole source of power for your home. This actually pulls more power out of your car's battery pack in a shorter period of time, but it can be the difference between being able to operate a simple electric heater or cook a meal and being completely in the dark. Sadly, V2G is only for Chidemo right now, and the CCS version of that charge standard, the one that's most used by automakers right now, is still being laid out when it comes to V2G, and thus there aren't very many CCS vehicles that can do two-way power transfer right now. And there aren't very many charging stations other than a few being deployed and developed that make it possible to pull power out of your car and back to the grid if you have a CCS system. The most accessible way, though, to get power out of your electric car in a weather-related emergency, like a winter storm, is to use a 12-volt power inverter. Some EVs are now coming with them built in. I've actually kept a refrigerator, lights, and obligatory teenager appeasement devices running for about four days during a blackout, and you can see the video about that here. In fact, a couple of you even reached out and told me about you using that tutorial to run your own lights and emergency equipment during this recent Texas storm. So thank you for reaching out and telling me, and I hope that you are now safe. In an emergency then, owning an electric vehicle can actually help you keep essential things running at home, at least for a few days if the grid is down. But I know that some of you will want me to address the big elephant in the room, namely all of the power that you need to charge those EVs. As long as people make use of charge timers, delaying their electric vehicle charging until the evening, the impact of everyone using the grid to charge their cars isn't all that great. And what's more, it can actually help the power grid you see, traditionally, when the electrical grid demand drops at nighttime, power stations have to spend time and money turning off excess generation capacity. Power stations are most reliable and most cost effective when they're producing a constant amount of power. The actual process of turning off a power station and then turning it back on again takes a lot of time and a lot of planning, and it actually costs generators money. They would much rather keep their power plants running at a constant output all day and then charge you less money at night time to use that electricity to charge your car. Even without vehicle to grid, it is still a win-win. The other thing that electric vehicles can do to help the resilience of the electrical grid is actually a knock-on one that you probably haven't thought of. The insane speed that battery technology has evolved thanks to the advent of electric vehicles. Electric vehicle battery technology has evolved so quickly over the last decade that it's now more affordable than ever before to build and deploy large-scale grid-attached storage systems. From Tesla's Powerwall at a domestic level to its power pack at the commercial level, planning and deploying grid-tied energy projects is easier and more cost-effective than it ever was before for commercial entities and utility companies. Moreover, pretty much every electric car manufacturer out there is now looking to implement or has already implemented some form of second life storage projects designed to reuse batteries at end of vehicle life in grid tied and off grid projects. And it's not just Tesla either. Many other companies are utilizing battery advancements from the EV world to make competing energy storage products. Enphase, for example, makes a completely cobalt-free domestic alternative to the Tesla Powerwall, and there are plenty of other companies doing the same thing out there. Then, of course, there's the similar advances that powertrain technology has brought. Because electric cars demand compact, powerful, efficient power transistors, there has been a monumental advancement in power electronics as well. Power transistors today are far more efficient and compact than they were a decade ago, and that's helped drive the development of affordable power inverters for use in domestic photovoltaic systems, not to mention in grid-tied backup or emergency power solutions. Finally, I should look at the benefits that the grid can get from increased microgeneration availability. Like electric cars, microgeneration having your own power generated at home, on your roof, or somewhere else on your property can help prepare you and the grid for power brownouts and blackouts, at least if you have a battery backup solution, which is one of the reasons I'm pro V2G, because your car has a battery already. 
And just like we've heard from people who've powered emergency electronics in their home from a small inverter driven by their electric car or inside their electric car, we've heard from plenty of people who own Tesla Powerwalls as well as competing products who've been just fine during this Texan winter storm because of their at-home power backup. While power cuts will cause your home generation to cut off if you don't have grid-tied batteries, because keeping your solar panels energised during a power cut could cause more damage to the grid or injure utility workers while they fix whatever went wrong, increasing amounts of micro-generation can actually reduce the demand on the overall local grid. And unlike what most people will tell you, solar panels will continue to produce power even if it's not a bright, sunny day. Sure, they do produce less electricity when there's less daylight, and of course they won't produce anything if they're covered by snow, but they can still help supplement grid demand, which can reduce demand on power stations and reduce the demand for pika plants. Sadly though, just like photovoltaic panels, V2G and grid-tied battery storage systems, most of these options are out of the price range for the average consumer. Unless you can pull a remortgage trick, as I just did with my own home, dropping enough in monthly mortgage payments from a drop in interest rates to completely fund a solar panel loan programme, then the chances are you're still stuck with relying on the local power grid for your power. Or are you? Because if you're feeling particularly handy, there are some DIY options out there. Jehu Garcia is your number one source of all things DIY Powerwall, and there are some other great YouTubers out there, so don't forget to check them out. I'll try and link to a couple below. Anyway, the point for all of you currently worrying about Texas grids, including Governor Abbott, is that renewable energy and electric vehicles won't bring Texas to its knees when there's a high demand caused by a winter storm or a summer heat wave. Poor planning will. Governor Abbott, perhaps it's time to go and talk to a certain South African businessman based out of Austin. I hear he's pretty good at planning for such things. That's it for today. As always, thanks to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month Patreons, Don Lyons, Raging Fellows, Jeffrey Songster, Anonymous Freak, Paul Conway, Laura Sanborn, Anthony Coates, and Tesla in the Gong, and our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters. Those are Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Sean Ueda, Will Graylin, and Ian. You could join all of these amazing Patreon supporters, and some of you have in the last couple of days, by following the links below. You'll also find a link below if you fancy sending us a donation through Ko-fi or Bitcoin. You'll also find a link to our free Discord server, so sign up and come and join in the fun. And if you are in need of some swag, don't forget to check out our merch over at Redbubble. After the names have finished scrolling, you should see a suggestion for a new video if YouTube is playing ball, so please consider watching it if you haven't, and I'll be back very soon. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!